This video is all about the auxiliary air valve which can be found on early Mercedes, Volvos, Citroens, BMWs, Porsches and a variety of other cars. The auxiliary air valve regulates the idle speed when the engine is cold. They come in a variety of different shapes and sizes and they are ludicrously expensive. Anywhere between two and five hundred pounds if you're lucky enough to be able to find one. We're going to be showing you how to disassemble one of these auxiliary air valves and potentially fix it if your problem is that this piston here no longer moves freely inside this housing. We'll be comparing the auxiliary air valve on a Mercedes 280 SL with that of a Mercedes 450 SL and seeing whether when you put these in hot water this rod here moves up by exactly the same amount on each car. What I'm keen to find out is whether this thermostatic bulb from Marley does exactly the same as this unit from Mercedes, which costs five times more. Now, for anybody who doesn't know, these little brass bulbs here are in contact with the coolant. And as the coolant heats up, the wax inside this bulb melts and expands and forces this rod up. So we'll be checking to see whether those two rods move up by exactly the same amount. And finally, we'll be checking to see whether the movement of this rod on a brand new bulb is exactly the same as the movement of this rod on this unit, which has been on a car for 40 years. Because if that rod doesn't move as much as it should, because maybe the wax has lost its uh, ability to expand, then this piston here will not be forced up as much as it should. The result being that you'll get air in the engine when you shouldn't, and that'll affect both your idle and your fuel consumption. Just before going on with the rest of the video, I just wanted to point out something that these videos, if you're not aware, take a lot of money to make. Just the parts alone in this video would be about £300. There would be something like 60 to 70 video clips taken over a two to three week period and edited together just to make this one video. So if you've watched this channel over the years and any of the videos have been helpful or you're one of the thousands of people that have asked questions, why not consider leaving a super thanks on the channel? It would help us enormously. These are two styles of auxiliary air valve or auxiliary air slide valves, which were found on many early Mercedes, Porsche, BMW, Volvo, etc. And if you're lucky enough to be able to find a working one of these second hand, you can pay anywhere from two to five hundred pounds for these units. This one is off a 1975 Mercedes 280 SL with a straight six M110 engine. And this one here is off the more common V8 engine. It came off a 1974 450 SL. The problem is that over time and through lack of use, these valves get stuck. And here is an example of a stuck piston in the housing. That piston should move freely up and down inside that housing, just like this one that we freed up. So we're going to have to figure out a way to free up that piston. But much, much worse than that is um, when I tried to we separate these two units here. Now, you should use a hydraulic press to separate them, but I didn't know that when I initially tried to separate these. I thought you could just put this in a vise and use a socket to tap it out. And lo and behold, what I did was I broke this very, very expensive auxiliary air valve. Initially, I had intended to repair this myself with these um, HUS brazing rods here, but having spoken to a number of experts in the field, um, when they'd stopped laughing at me, they all told me this was a job for a professional TIG welder. This housing is made of some kind of aluminium alloy, and it's going to need a specialist repair by an expert. It's way beyond my technical abilities, and one of the best people in the country for these kind of repairs is Bob at the machine shop that you may have seen on Matt Armstrong's channel and various other channels. He has very kindly agreed to have a go at repairing this. Now, I'm not sure that he's going to be able to do it, but if anyone can, he can. So I'm going to package this up today, send this off to Bob at the machine shop and see what he has to say and hopefully... He'll be able to repair this for us. Whilst we wait to hear back to see if Bob at the machine shop can actually fix our housing, I wanted to point out the differences or some of the differences between the auxiliary air slide valves on a 450SL and a 280SL. Something that um, you may or may not notice is that the height of this here is actually slightly greater than the distance from the bottom of that to the start of that air opening. 
and a more obvious difference is the actual shape of the opening is different and what that means is that as the engine heats up and this piston is forced up different amounts of air will be emitted into the uh, 110 engine on the 280SL than say on the 450SL. So for example, these two wouldn't be interchangeable. They'd have a different curve if you could plot the air in the engine. Another difference is that on the V8 450SL, this is a much larger hose than on the 280SLs or the M110 engines. On the M110 engine, the inlet and outlet pipes are perpendicular. There's no offset on the V8 engines. First, there's an offset of pipes, and obviously this pipe is coming out in the same plane as this pipe. So these two wouldn't be interchangeable anyway. I suspect that when we finally manage to get this to pieces, we'll find that the piston and the spring are exactly the same dimensions. And you may also find that the bulb is exactly the same, the little brass bulb here with the wax inside, although they do have different numbers stamped on them. I have a theory that over time, the wax inside these bulbs here loses its ability or expansion properties, and this rod does not move up as much as it should. And the consequence of that is that you are still getting air in the engine as the engine heats up this gap is not completely closing now it just so happens that you can still get these little wax filled bulbs from the Bosch classic center in Germany they're not cheap they're about 130 euros and there may be a markup from a Bosch service center when I buy one but I'm going to attempt to get one and just compare the travel on a new bulb versus an old 40 year old bulb. What's interesting is that the Bosch Classic Part Center only supply one bulb with one part number. So it might be that the number stamped on there and also the plastic housings don't mean anything at all. What I have ascertained is that the travel on these two rods, as far as I can make out and measure, is exactly the same. What I'm gonna do is to see how far, if at all, that piston rises with one jug of boiling water. So it is rising, which is good, which means that that uh, thermal expansion element actually works. Now let's try the 280SL. That is rising, albeit slowly. I've speeded up the footage just to make it slightly easier to see. We just need to now mark where that rises to. What we've ascertained is that on the 280SL and the 450SL auxiliary air valves that we've got, the amount of distance that the piston travels with boiling water is pretty much exactly the same. The next question is, will this Marley bulb here rise exactly the same amount? Well, this experiment shows that the Marley rod moves the same as the Mercedes one, which is the same as the 280SL and the 450SL. One thing worth mentioning is that when you buy this from Mercedes, it does come with this washer or ring here. Now, I haven't actually disassembled this yet to see how important that is, and whether you actually need that. So the next stage is to disassemble this and see what it looks like once we take this all the way out of the Next housing. Up we're going to have a go at getting the stuck piston out of this housing. What I'm doing is I've got a 7 16th socket and I'm just moving this piston up slightly just to break the rust and what we'll do is we'll put some penetrating oil in there. We don't want to move it too far otherwise we'll never get it back down again but once we've broken the main seal often these things will release. We're just going to use a little bit of plus gas in here now get it all around the edges also down on this edge here. I'm going to drop a screw or a bolt through this hole here and and try and get it to come out of that hole there and a the little trick is to use a magnet using a neodymium magnet that bolt will find its way through that hole without any issues just using a series of washers and a spring washer in there and two of these uh, nuts up here locked together. We've managed to tighten that down. So this is now really tight. What we're actually going to do is use a series of washers and then see if we can wind one of these nuts down to pull it out. So now I'm just going to use a big washer over the end and then these two small washers and then see if we can tighten one of these nuts to wind that piston out. Here goes. So 
So using this method, when we pull the piston out, we're only ever going to be able to get it flush because the washers will hit the edge of that. To get the piston all the way out, you can use a hose clamp that just sits on the outside of the housing but doesn't stop the piston coming out and then tighten this up. That's it out, I think. And there we have it. Now we just need to take out the spring and clean up the inside of this and we should be pretty much good to go. This is the auxiliary air slide which we bought on eBay which was described as in good condition and you can see just how manky that is. So this is the one that we'll be refurbing and putting back on the car. I've been along to my friends at Auto Classico, borrowed their hydraulic press and pressed this all the way out of the housing so we can get a better look at it. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give this to a machine shop to see if they can take this washer out and possibly make me a new aluminium part. Now, the way you would get this out if you didn't have a machine shop is you would take this rod out. I'm not sure if that's supposed to come out or not. And then you'd try and wedge some kind of screwdriver or something like that and then pry that up. But nine times out of ten, you'll end up damaging it. So what I want to know is whether we can just manufacture these two pieces and just turn them on the lathe because the other thing is on these new bulbs, the diameter of this top bit is more than the diameter of the plastic bit on the old bulbs. So we'll manufacture one of these, drop it inside, probably fill it with some kind of um, high temperature sealant and then press this back on and that should be then ready to be pressed back into the casing and we can put the whole thing back together and that should be job done. We've come out here to the back of beyond to our favorite machinist and what he's done is he has made up a little part for us. It took him hours but we got there in the end at that and I gather this was not a five minute job. No. <laughs> what um, was the uh, what did you run into? So it's a machine that into the bottom of it and, so the, ta and the taper so it sits in there Perfectly like that flush. and on top of there was a um, a plastic ring mm -hmm. with um, a taper on it, if you like, and then that was pushed into there to hold it. So that's just the push fit, in. that top yeah. thing. How did you get that out without completely ruining it? Did well, you just I did. Your... I machined it back. Like, oh, OK, cool. Because it came up over the top of that. And they kind of fold it over they, slightly. They had just slightly on the edge, yeah, to yeah. stop it coming out. Well, wouldn't it be amazing if somebody actually made these here? Because you can get the bulbs from Mercedes, but no one makes this bit. And obviously, <laughs> to try and take that apart without ruining it would be quite difficult. Now that we've had our fitting made up, it just remains to press this back in. Um, ideally, you want to press it in this way when you're putting it back together. When you're taking it apart, this will come out this way, but we're going to press it in that way. And then we just need to press the top in. Just bearing in mind that when you do press it in, that slot there has to perfectly align with this output here. So there we go. We've pushed that in flush. Now we just need to push the cylinder in. We've got this back together and now it's just a matter of putting this back on the car, which we will do in a separate video. If I zoom in on there, you can see what a small gap that is. So that piston does not need to move up very much to completely shut off the air going through this valve. I'm going to finish this video here. In the next video, we are going to be fitting that auxiliary air valve, which lives underneath there. Um, there is a leak at the moment, primarily, I think, because the one that's on the car at the moment doesn't have a gasket. So we'll be sorting that out and at the same time doing a full coolant flush on this car. Just arrived back from Bob at the machine shop is this air slide valve from our 450 SL parts car. This is ready to go back on a... Um, 450 SL or 350 SL. I have uploaded a separate video showing him repairing this, but just in case you haven't seen that video and would like to, I will include that footage now at the end of this video. Our auxiliary air slide has just arrived with Bob at the machine shop, and the first thing he has to do is just press out the thermostatic bulb. We've already pressed out the piston. You can press out the last bit using just a vise, but to actually press the piston out and put it back together, you are going to need a hydraulic press. The secret to a good weld is to clean 
all the parts you're going to weld thoroughly so that's the main housing but you need to also clean the small bit that you're welding on um, and in this particular case we're going to just get to clean the inside as well because we need to make sure that the weld penetrates all the way through and what makes this job tricky is that that um, channel there needs to be completely round and clear one of the great advantages of a machine shop is that you have a beautiful welding table that not only allows you to uh, clamp your welding machine on but also to clamp pieces on now initially when this is clamped down there is some movement in the part that's to be welded on because obviously it's not even so the force needs to actually be moved slightly and like a true professional, Bob is actually using something between the clamp and the piece so as not to mark the piece. And once it's clamped down on one side like that, there's no longer any movement and we are ready to start welding. As I mentioned, this is a TIG weld here and the first thing to do is actually tack that broken piece on and use a professional tap of the spanner to move it round. It's going to need several little tack welds there just to make sure that the piece can't move. Obviously, that's going to be way too hot to move that round with your hand. And then you need to go around and actually fill every single gap up with weld. Now, this is a complicated task. This footage has been speeded up and edited, and it was no five minute job to do this. The secret of a true professional is not to get weld all over the place because the more precise you are when you're actually welding, the less time you have to spend grinding excess weld off at a later date. And in this particular case, obviously there's gonna be a piston sliding in and out. So any excess weld on the mating surfaces comes off with a lathe to make sure we've got a perfectly flat surface where this bolts to the engine block. And then of course, inside the unit, you need to make sure it's perfectly smooth with no excess weld. So that's a run out gauge there. And if you do have any little bits of weld on there, you need to take those out with um, a lathe and then after much toing and fro, we get a perfectly smooth surface and internals. That's the finished piece there. Bob has very kindly actually pressed it back together for us. So a huge thanks to Bob at the machine shop.